I get called a futurologist, which I don't like because I have a fairly dim view of most futurology, with some notable exceptions. Um, in that I often find that a lot of so-called futurologists are really expressing their wish list or their prejudice in some kind of prediction or theory. And what I really am is somebody who just asks questions about the future that I think are relevant and important so that we can try and shape it in a positive and ethical way. So people call me a futurist or futurologist because it's the nearest shorthand for what I do. Uh, what I really think I am is, is simply somebody who's very curious and believes that the future is up for grabs and we should try and make it more ethical and sustainable. The current narrative of the future in our press and our politics is essentially it's going to be rubbish. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you come out of the womb and they say, bad move, uh, particularly in the UK. And then if, uh, and if you're in any doubt as to how terrible the world is, we have the Daily Mail just to remind us just how dreadful it's going to be. But there's a very embedded cynical narrative about human nature and the future, which I think is dangerous because if we don't imagine a better future, how on earth are we going to make it? So I'm not saying the future will be better, but I'm saying it could be, and I think everybody of good conscience should be in that game. So that's that's kind of what the last book was about, and, and demonstrating some of the tools we might have at our disposal if we use them wisely to make a better and more ethical future. Uh, advances in synthetic biology, genetics, stem cell therapy, nanotechnology, 3D printing, the increasing power of computing and our interconnectedness through networks, the renewables revolution that's uh, going on, the idea of distributed uh, energy production, and obviously the, the more de demographic trends or, or, or I say societal trends of people beginning to form their own networks of influence and power, which can do things that, that old school industrial governments find very hard to do. The futurologists I, I like the most are generally the ones that are, that are the most doubtful or the most questioning of themselves, although I do have quite a lot of time for Ray Kurzweil's A Law of Accelerating Returns because I think if you look at the predictions he's made in many areas, they've panned out quite well, more so than most other people. I still have some problems that I think Kurzweil doesn't deal with how society will interact, slow down, speed up, send a curveball into these technology trends as they do. And it's a discussion I had with perhaps my favorite futurist, which is John C.D. Brown. I would say that John C.D. Brown, who himself, himself doesn't really call himself a futurist, but he used to run Xerox Park Labs. He's one of the architects of the digital revolution. He writes fascinating books about culture and technology. He actually calls himself the chief of confusion, which, <laughs> which I think is a fairly self-effacing uh, description. But he's a, a very prescient, brilliant thinker. I interviewed him for the last book, and um, uh, I have no doubt I'll be talking to him again for this next one. Provisionally, it's called The Shift, Why Our Systems Are Failing Us and What Will Replace Them. So having written the last book, which is very much about technology options, I, I became very clear that our future will, will be guided as much by our institutional societal response than it will be by technology. I mean, if you look at, for instance, advances in healthcare, it takes an average of between 17 or 18 years for a proven advance in healthcare to actually reach the cohort of patients it could help. You know, and that's not a technological problem, that's a societal institutional problem. You know, we have a workplace where 70% of people are disengaged from their work. We have an energy system that can't keep up with demand and is visiting on us a financial crisis. We have a financial system that is wholly out of step with people's perceptions of value and uh, increases inequality in the world. Uh, we have an education system that's educating people into the past rather than into the future, which is going to be radically different, and so on and so forth. And, so, and I think we're seeing this more and more, and, and we're beginning to feel it and the clash between that old-school industrial way of organizing society and the possibilities that technology brings and how they're, they're really mismatching and really not gelling together very well at the moment. And so the next book is really about looking at that problem and visiting the innovators in institutional change that are perhaps giving us a window on and a roadmap to the future. So looking at you know people who are rebooting the idea of a school or a healthcare system or uh, energy production uh, facility and so on and so forth. So it's innovation, but the societal, cultural innovation that uh, I think we don't talk about enough. There's a number of schools I'm very interested in that seem to be doing very different things. Actually, for the last book, I didn't make it into the book, but I went to see a school in New Zealand called Unlimited, and this is a school where teachers advertise their lessons and, and children go if they want. And it, you know, your immediate reaction to that is, oh my God, that sounds like a recipe for feral students on drugs, barricading teachers in classrooms, 
while they set the place on fire. You know, that's just that's your, that's my own interaction. But actually, it turns out that what happens is it's a very good model for, for sort of passion-centered, student-centric learning. These students are coming out with some of the best marks in New Zealand. They're very well socially adjusted. A lot of them are leaving the school and forming their own businesses. And rather than the teacher being the authority, the students are, and they guide their own learning. And they also often, quite often tell the, the teachers what they want to learn. Uh, so, you know, that's one example um, that I really like. I'm also looking at uh, a lot of the off-grid communities that are coming on board and how they're dealing with some of their problems. I think you know islands like Samsoft, Denmark are very interesting, but also places like Rockport, Missouri, where the, the electricity meters are going backwards because they're generating 127% of their needs. You know, and what does that do to an organisation or a town? I mean, you know, I, I've been talking to a number of um, corporations recently about you know what would it be like if you didn't have your own electricity bill, and you know, how would that affect your business? And it's something that they're, they're beginning to consider now. I think the crowd investing idea is very interesting as well. I, I advise a company called Trillion Fund, and they're a crowd investing platform which allows people to invest as little as a fiver in a renewable energy revolution, which has a return of about 7 or 8%. So it's a good way of you know, getting involved in something good, but also benefiting your pension or your, or your bank balance. And, and, but, it's, but it works with the crowd, which is, again, a, this is something we've only really seen in the last five years. The theory I'm working on at the moment, or at least the frame I'm working on at the moment, I'm doing some of this with Forum for the Future, is the idea that the digital revolution was, was like a trailer, really. That if you looked at what happened to the record industry or the video rental industry or what happened to Kodak versus Instagram, for instance, you can see you know, some organizations, you know, Kodak, Blockbuster, EMI, whoever, who just totally didn't understand the digital revolution. But I think that's a trailer, in a way sort of democratization of power, a loss of the access to the means of production and distribution, a complete misunderstanding of what it is they're actually selling or trying to do, really misplacing where the value is, you know, placing the value in the, pro in the actual physical thing rather than the content of it, so on and so forth. A reduction in asymmetry of information, reduced barriers to entry, all sorts of things. Now you can see all that happening in the digital world and if you talk to CEOs about what went wrong with those um, organizations, they're, they're wax lyrical about how stupid um, their predecessors were. But then you talk about 3D printing or programmable biology or nanotechnology where you see that same democratization of power and programmability uh, coming to the physical world, you know, synthetic biology, 3D printing, and then get them to look at you know, what's going to happen to the tour industry or the car manufacturing industry, and, and they start to look a little bit worried. And, it, and I think that's interesting. You know? So I think you know, we have seen the trailer. It's not, a, it's not a perfect analogy, but I think it's a pretty good one to start with. And what I'm doing now is finding, I guess, the Instagrams, the Spotify's, the Skypes, of healthcare and you know food production. I mean, it's interesting to me that if you look at the digital revolution, almost none of the revolutions, innovations came from incumbents. You know, PayPal wasn't invented by a bank. Um, Skype was invented by I think a couple of guys in a flat in Estonia or something similar. Amazon, you know, wasn't invented by a bookstore, etc., etc., etc. So you know, who are these outliers? But who are going to do things in 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 uh, healthcare and manufacture and energy production and food production? Who are they? I'm, I'm looking for. So I advise Trillion Fund, as I say, which is a crowd investing platform for renewables. I advise the Virgin Earth Challenge, which is Richard Branson's $25 million prize for taking carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere. Um, and we're down to 11 finalists there from 2,600 applications, which is pretty good. Um, I'm, I'm advising Pearson University, or Pearson College now, which is a new private university being set up by Pearson Education, which I think potentially could be very interesting. I also sit on a steering committee at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers as well because I love hanging out with engineers because they always tell me whether it's going to work or not. Scientists will say, yes, of course it's going to work. Of course, in theory, there's nothing to stop it. And economists will go, well, you know, well, economists will just lie to you in their own particular dialect. But uh, <laughs> engineers always go, well, hang on, given uh, where we are now, how much it costs and where we are on the planet and supply chain and everything, uh, yes, it'll work at this level and it'll, here's your variance. So I like hanging out with engineers quite a lot because like, they always give me a good reality check on some of the stuff I hear coming out of the more enthusiastic um, uh, profits of technology. I'm looking forward very much to the uh, conference. You know, some of the people you've got speaking, uh, you know, I really like to hear them. Some people I haven't heard, some people I've heard before. I think it'll be a fun weekend. And nobody's going to go away having not had new things to think about.
you know, me included. And I'm expecting to be challenged and to be challenging. You know, I hope it has a spirit of investigation and curiosity rather than anything adversarial. And, and I, I get the impression that it's going to be much more about, you know, how do we make the world a better one? Because, you know, it's the only game in town, really, isn't it? But, I mean, the future's up for grabs. We need to grab hold, and our current institutions aren't doing it, so we need people to think boldly and differently, you know? There's a great um, Chinese proverb I often end my talks with. When the winds of change blow, some people build walls and some people build windmills. And we've got far too many people building walls at the moment and not enough people building windmills. So let's be some windmill uh, builders at that conference, I hope.